Somerset Maugham once told us that he has never pretended to be anything but a storyteller. It has amused him to tell stories, and he's told a great many. Now, those of us who helped to make these three into a film are happy once again to pay tribute to a great writer. Here he is to introduce Trio. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, if you see me facing you once again in this unaccustomed role for me, you only have yourselves to blame. If you hadn't liked the four stories we showed you in quartet, we shouldn't have been encouraged to show you three more. Of course, we know it's a risk to try to repeat success, and we have to leave it to you to judge if we've been well advised or not. The Verger. On an afternoon in May 1924, there was to be a christening at St. Peter's Neville Square, a church much favoured by the fashionable for these ceremonies. The verger, Albert Foreman, was ironing his second best gown for the occasion. During his 17 years of service, he'd had a succession of these gowns, but he'd never been able to throw them away. And so they lay wrapped in brown paper in a bottom drawer in his bedroom. I was going to clear out that drawer this morning, Mr. Foreman. So I was. Well, how much longer are you going to keep putting it off? I don't know. I just haven't got the art to get rid of them somehow. What you can possibly want with a lot of old gowns cluttering up the place for beats me. All right, I'll do it tomorrow. You'd better had if you don't want to see them turned into dusters. Back by six, won't you? Can't say. With old Ferguson, you always knew where you were. 35 minutes to the dot. But with this new chap, anything might happen. I'll have your tea for you at six anyway. <coughs> right, you are, Mrs. Brown. Thank you. What a job. Thank you. Thank you, Virgil. Very nice service. Thank you very much, sir. Five Bob. And him the tenth inheritor of a foolish face. I don't know what the aristocracy is coming to. <laughs> Took his time, didn't he? Yeah, he? believes in doing it proper while he's about it. What are you waiting for? Oh, his neighbours wants to see me about them bells. Oh? Ferguson always left them to me. What's he want to bother himself with them for? Because he's the sort that likes to have his finger in every pie. Well, if you ask me, it'll take a bit of getting used to. Foreman, will you come into the vestry a minute? I have something to say to you. Very good, sir. Very nice christening, I thought, sir. Funny how the baby stopped crying the moment you took him. I've noticed they very often do. After all, I've had a good deal of practice with them. Good afternoon, my lord. Afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, sir. Didn't expect to find you here today. Didn't myself, as a matter of fact, but the vicar here wanted to talk, so here we are. We've got something rather unpleasant to say to you, Foreman. You've been here a great many years. I think his lordship and the general agree with me that you've always fulfilled the duties of your office to the satisfaction of everybody concerned. Admirably, admirably. Mm. Thank you, sir. But a most extraordinary circumstance came to my knowledge the other day. I felt it my duty to impart it to the church wardens. I discovered, to my astonishment, that you can neither read nor write. The last vicar knew that, sir. He said it didn't make no difference. He always said there was a great deal too much education in the world for his taste. It's the most amazing thing I ever heard. Do you mean to say that you've been virgin of this church for 17 years and never learned to read and write? I went into service when I was 12, sir. The cook at my first place tried to teach me once, but uh, I didn't seem to have the knack for it. And then, what with one thing and another, I never seem to have the time. Don't, don't you ever want to write a letter? The lady I lodge with is quite a scholar, sir. And if I want to write a letter, she writes it for me. It's not as if I was a betting man. Uh, well, I've talked the matter over with these gentlemen, Foreman, and they agree with me that the situation is quite impossible. 
at a church like St. Peter's Naval Square. We cannot have a verger who can neither read nor write. No, sir. So please understand that I have no complaints against you. You always do your work quite satisfactorily. I have the highest opinion, both of your character and your capacity. But we haven't the right to take the risk of some accident which might happen owing to your lamentable ignorance. I see, sir. It's a matter of prudence as well as of principle. I never took to him, not from the first. I made a great mistake ever giving him St. Peter's. Didn't the others say nothing? No, he jockeyed them into it. But I could see they didn't like it. And so I should hope. He nagged them into it. That's what he did. You're going to let yourself be put upon without making a fuss? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Brown. I have my pride. Even if I can't read all right. What are you going to do? Sleep on it. And decide tomorrow. Good afternoon, Foreman. Good afternoon, sir. I have some good news for you. I met Mrs. Fitzwilliam just now. She'll have the new altar cloth ready by Friday. About time, too, sir. She's been promising it ever since Christmas. Well, now we shall have it ready for Easter. <laughs> we must be thankful for small mercies. Yes, sir. Well, now, Foreman, have you thought over our little talk yesterday? Yes, sir. Well? I'm very sorry, sir. I'm afraid it's no good. Oh, come now, Foreman. That's not the right spirit. I'm too old a dog to learn new tricks, sir. I've lived a good many years without knowing how to read or write. And without wishing to praise myself, I, I think I may say I've done my duty in that state of life in which it has pleased a merciful providence to place me. And if I could learn now, I don't know as I'd want to. You've quite made up your mind? Quite, sir. In that case, Foreman, I'm afraid you'll have to go. Yes, I quite understand. I should be happy to hand in my resignation as soon as you've found someone to take my place. Albert had never troubled with such questions before. The vergers of St. Peter's, like the popes in Rome, were there for life. He'd saved a tidy sum, but not enough to live on without doing something. It occurred to him now that a cigarette would comfort him, but his packet was empty. He decided not to take his usual way home, but wandered into a street in search of a tobacconist. It was a long street, but he couldn't find a shop that sold cigarettes. There was no doubt about it, he'd have to go home without one. What's going on? Oh, oh, it's Fancy that. Yeah. Who's your lucky fellow? Oh, I said, of course. So you've caught him at last, have you? I never thought he'd got much of a chance. Well, I like that. He's been after me for months. That's right, and we're celebrating. See, have a glass of beer, Mr. Foreman. I don't think I will, thank you. Oh, come on. Well, I've just gone up to my room. I'll join you presently. Come Oh, I am sorry, Mr. Foreman. I knew the minute you came in. It's that vicar, isn't it? Give me the sack here. Eh? After 17 years. Whatever are you going to do now? I don't know exactly. I've got a sort of an idea on the way home. A funny thing happened. I wanted a packet of fags. And I had to walk over half a mile before I found a tobacconist. What's so funny about that? Well, I can't be the only chap that walks along them streets and wants a fag. I shouldn't wonder but what a fellow might do very well somewhere around there. Tobacco and sweets, you know. I've got a bit of money saved up. I've got half a mind to buy a little shop and see what happens. You do have ideas, I must say, Mr. Foreman. That's not the only one. I've got another. What's going to happen to you now Glad's getting married? Oh, Ted'll come and live here, of course. Glad's got her own room. It only means buying a double bed. Oh, that'll make trouble, that will. A young fellow like Teddy doesn't want his mother-in-law living in the house. I'll tell you what you ought to do. You ought to marry again, Mrs. Brown. <laughs> Who'd want to marry an old woman like me? I would. Don't talk silly. An old bachelor like you and me a widow all these years, you're out of your mind. Don't you believe it. I'll run the tobacco side of the business, and you'll run the sweets, see? 
I don't know if I'm standing on my head or my heels. Make up your mind, Mrs. Brown. My name's Emma, Mr. Foreman. That's good enough for me. How about a kiss? I've been kissed like that since my poor husband passed away. Not many widows can say that, I'll lay. Come along, let's go and tell the others. And tomorrow we'll go looking for a shop. What a row they're making down there. What are they up to? Stop the music! I've got an announcement to make. I've offered my hand and heart to Mrs. Brown. And what did Mrs. Brown say? She said, OK. The next day, Albert and Emma went along the street and, by good luck, found a little shop to let that looked as though it would exactly suit them. Twenty-four hours later, they'd taken it, and within a month, Albert Foreman was set up in business as tobacconist and newsagent. Very nice, too. All we want now is a few customers. Give them time, Emma. Can't expect to do much business the first day we open. Oh, look, there's a man at the window. Or just one of them window shoppers. Told you so. I'm as nervous as the day we were married, Mr. Foreman. Not so much of the Mr. Foreman. We've been married a month now. And it's high time you started calling me by my first name. And that's Albert. I know. The fact is, I've called you Mr. Foreman for 11 years. I can't get out of the habit now. I expect I'll call you Mr. Foreman till the day I bury you. All right. Have it your own way. All I can say is it would sound a bit funny if somebody heard you saying to me in the middle of the night, get in your own side of the bed, Mr. Foreman, you'll have me on the floor next. I don't anticipate anyone being in my bedroom in the middle of the night, Mr. Foreman. And I shouldn't have thought you did either. Penny for suckers, please. Got a penny? Of course I have. Emma, get a penny with the suckers for the gentleman. Here are. Here's a tenner for you. What, for me? What for? For nothing, because you're our first customer. Now run along and tell all your friends. Well, that's a nice way to make money, I must say. Give us that penny. You think this is just a penny, don't you? Well, it isn't. Where's the hammer? Whatever are you going to do now? I've got to nail this penny to the counter. And when we've made our first thousand, I shall have it mounted for you to wear as a brooch. And I thought I was marrying a quiet, respectable man. Who's they? Glad and Ted. I told you they was coming to supper. That's them. I've gone up the door. Hello, Glad. Come on in, Ted. Hello, dear. Hello, Mum. Good evening, Ted. Good evening, Mum. You can all sit down to table. Supper's just ready. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Oh, I must say, there are things I'm more thankful for than cold mutton. His lordship's getting quite fancy in his old age. Well, what's the matter, Glenn? You look as if you've been crying. So you do, Glenn. Ted been knocking you about? That I haven't. What's the trouble, then? Well, she's expecting. I know that. That's nothing to cry about. Tell him, Ted. I've got the sack. Oh, Ted. There's me expecting and... And no money coming in. I, I don't know what we're going to do. Now, stop crying, Glad, and just listen to me. We haven't done so badly since we opened the shop. In fact, we've made a nice little profit. If we can make a success out of one shop, there's no reason why we shouldn't make a success out of another. You can't do a thing like that. You're out of your mind. No, I'm not. I'll get another shop and put Ted and Glad in to manage it. Dad, you wouldn't do that. No, I'll tell you another thing. When the baby's born, We'll have a slap-up christening at St. Peter's, Neville Square. We are to take care that this child be brought to the bishop to be confirmed by him, so as soon as he can say the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments in the common tongue. 
and be further instructed in the church catechism set forth for that purpose. Now, will the parents and the godparents come with me to this dear to see? Went off all night, eh? Thank you. It is Foreman, isn't it? Yes, sir. I thought it must be. I hardly recognized you. Well, I do a thing I like to do it in style, sir. Getting on all right? No. I'm not complaining, sir. Uh, seeing as how this is an occasion, sir, I thought perhaps you wouldn't mind if I was to give something for the poor and needy of this parish. Of course I wouldn't mind. Thank you, sir. second shop, like the first, had been a success. It now occurred to him that if he could run two, he could run half a dozen. So he and Emma began walking about London, and whenever they found a long street and no tobacconists and a shop to let, they took it. In the course of ten years, he'd acquired no less than ten shops, and he was making money hand over fist. He went round to all of them himself every Monday, collected the week's takings and took them to the bank. One day, he was making his usual call. Good morning, Mr. Foreman. Regular as clockwork, you are. That's right. I've got no patience with them fellows who keeps their money under the bed. Asking for trouble, I'll call it. The manager would like to see you before you go. He asked me to let him know when you looked in. Well, what's the matter? Nothing wrong, is it? No, no, of course not. He only wants a word or two with you, that's all. Well, banks do go bust, don't they? Not this one, Mr. Foreman. I think he's free now. I'll just go and see. Mr. Foreman, will you come in, please? Good morning, Mr. Foreman. I was expecting you. Regular as clockwork, aren't you? That's what the fellow outside said. You won't you sit down? Thank you, sir. You have a cigarette? Uh, no, thanks. I don't smoke them now. I'll sell them. And from what I know, you make a very good thing out of it, eh? I'm not complaining. Now, Mr. Foreman, I wanted to have a talk with you about the money you've got on deposit with us. Do you know exactly how much it is? Not within a pound or two, but I've got a pretty good rough idea. Apart from what you're paying in this morning, it's something over 30,000 pounds. That's a very large sum of money, Mr. Foreman. I should have thought you'd do better to invest it. I wouldn't want to take no risks. Quite right, too. We'd make you out a list of perfectly safe securities, sound industrials. They'd bring you in a higher rate of interest than we could possibly afford to give you. I well, never had anything to do with stocks and shares. No, oh, we'd attend to everything. All you'd have to do would be just to sign the transfers. Yes, but how would I know what I was signing? Well, you could read, I suppose. Well, that's just it. I can't. I know it sounds funny, but there it is. I can't read all right, only my name. But that's the most extraordinary thing I've ever heard. Well, you see, it's like this, sir. I never had the opportunity until it was too late, and then somehow I wouldn't. I got obstinate like. But do you mean to tell me that you've been able to build up this important business and amass a fortune of over 30,000 pounds without being able to read or write? Good heavens, man. What would you be today if you had been able to? Well, I can tell you that, sir. I'd be Virgil at St. Peter's, Neville Square. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Noel, I believe, is a story of my own invention. But I shouldn't like to have to go into the witness box in a court of law and take my oath on it. I think I might venture to make a use of a phrase of Dr. Johnson's and say that if a story is good, it's unlikely to be new, and if it's new, it's unlikely to be good. The fact is, we storytellers, like the hero of a celebrated poem, have come too late into a world too old. 
Mr. Noel. I was prepared to dislike Max Collada even before I knew him. The war had just finished and passenger traffic in the ocean-going liners was heavy. Accommodation was very hard to get and you had to put up with whatever the agents chose to offer you. I'm sorry, Mr. Gray. I'm afraid there's only a single berth in a cabin for two. Oh, that's all right, my boy. Thank you very much for all the trouble you've taken. I know how difficult it is. Well, look forward to seeing you tomorrow, eh? Goodbye. Goodbye. Who's next? Me. I think I'm next. That's right. You're next after me. And my name is Kalada. K-L-A-D-A, Kalada. You've got a berth reserved for me on the Queen of the Indies. And my name's Ramsey. One at a time, please. Kalada. British subject. I was before this gentleman. Is that right? Gentlemen, after such a compliment, I can only say yes. Fella, the floor's all yours. My name's Ramsey. You've had a message about me from the colonial office. Oh, yes, Mr. Ramsey. You're going to Aden, aren't you? And that's right, with the Mrs. Ramsey. Excuse me, I'll get your tickets. Thank you. VIP, I suppose. No, just a civil servant. You're taking your wife to Aden? Why not? But that climate. My wife's had two years alone in London already. Okay, fella, she's your wife. Here we are, sir. Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey. Cabin 102, deck A. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. See you aboard. Uh, my name's Kalana. Uh, you want a berth reserved for me on the Queen of the Indies, stopping off at Portside. I'll just see if your name's on the list, sir. Um, you, uh, you like a cigar, hmm? I don't smoke. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. I get them made special. Same fellow what makes for the Aga Khan and Winnie. I'm afraid, Mr. Cloud, we can't get you on the Queen of the Indies. Oh, yes, you can. I'm afraid not, sir. You see, we have one cancelled berth and seven ahead of you on the waiting list. Now, where's your boss, huh? He can't see you at the moment, sir. Oh, can't he? Where's his office? Over there? He's rather busy at the moment. Yeah, so am I. I can spend him five minutes. You look after me, I look after you. Oh, thank you very much indeed, sir. Who am I sharing with, Joe? Uh, Mr. Collada, sir. Oh, foreigner, eh? No, sir. English, at least that's what he says he is. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yep. Sharing a cabin, I believe. Yes, bit of luck. I'm all for us English sticking together when we travel abroad. Are you English too? British to the backbone. I was born in the heart of our great empire. Mm -hmm. Buckingham Palace. No, but quite near. A stone's throw away. They used to have to change the guard on tiptoe so as not to wake me up. <laughs> I was a very delicate child. What's your racket? I beg your pardon. I'm in the precious stones and jewelry business, and I don't mind telling you there's no one in the trade who knows more about it than I do myself. The three on the four. What you say your racket was? I didn't say, but if you particularly want to know, I'm in the civil service. Grand nuts? No. I happen to be an economist. Ah. I hear the finances in Hong Kong are not too good. I suppose you're going out there to... How did you know I was going to Hong Kong? Uh, ah, there isn't much, I don't know. 
I must go to the dining room and get a seat at the table. Wait a minute, it's all been fixed. I got you a seat. I thought we were sharing the same cabin, and we ought to sit at the same table. How about a drink, huh? Not now, thank you very much. I promised to have one with somebody else. Well, have them while you're waiting. A steward. Oh, here they are. Hello, ah, Ramsay. See you later. Not that old chap, no. Hello, Ramsay. Remember me, huh? Calada. We met yesterday at the agency. No, I'm sorry. I don't remember you. Oh, don't be silly. Of course you do. Mrs. Ramsay, I presume. How do you do? Have a drink, Mrs. Ramsay. We've asked Mr. Gray to have one with us. Well, now you can have one with me, and you can buy the next round. Sit down, Mrs. Ramsay, please. Steward. Uh, we have a long trip ahead of us, and the sooner we get to know each other, the better. Uh, how you like the ship, Mrs. Ramsay? Could be worse, eh? It seems to be quite comfortable. Not a bad crowd on board for this time of the year, huh? Well, we haven't really met anybody yet. If there's anyone here you want to meet, just let me know, and I'll fix it up in a jiffy. I don't think we need trouble, you. You're going to Aden, aren't you? I don't think you like it. It's very hot. I know it very well. There's very little Mr. Calada doesn't know well. That's right. Steward! <laughs> Your friend Collard. I think I'll probably have to murder him before the trip's out. He's awful. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear, here he comes. Come on, darling. Rounding up. Having a breath of fresh air. <laughs> I got your ticket for the day's sweep. You don't really want one, you know. Oh, must be a sport. You never know, besides, you might win. I want a couple of bucks from you for the sports. A couple of what? Oh, ten shillings. I got it all organized. Would you believe it? They didn't want to have a fancy dress ball, but I soon docked them into it. Oh, Billy, I have got you down for the, uh, for the shift's cut. Oh, yes, but I shall have to try my songs out with the piano. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> He's a singer. Uh, can you play the piano? As a matter of fact, I can a bit. Well, would you play for him? No. Oh, but England expects every man on board who will do his duty. Yeah. I am going to do card tricks. You know there's nothing I dislike more than card tricks. Oh, wait till you see mine. I can make a pack of cards to anything I want. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give up gambling. It wasn't fair on the other players. I, I know too much about cards. Mr. Know-all, eh? <laughs> it's funny how that name's got around. But I ask you, what sort of a trip would it be without me, huh? You certainly are the life and soul of the party. I know I am. I'm not conceited, but I'm the most popular man on this ship, and I can't help knowing it. <laughs> how about a snifter before lunch, huh? Very well. Here's your couple of bucks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> ah, damn, Stuart! You think that was clever? You haven't seen anything yet. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the grand finale. I'm going to show you a trick that only four men in the world can do. And I thought the other three. <laughs> <laughs> now, for this trick, I shall need the assistance of two members of the audience. And to show you I don't mind who they are, I'm going to pick them out myself. Ah! Mrs. Ramsay, will you be good enough to lend me your services? And, and you, Mr. Fellows? No, Mr. Cloud, Oh, please, come uh... along now. Don't be shy. Nothing to be shy about. I'm not shy, am I? Now, give them a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. where you went. Oh, it's so hot in there, I thought I'd come out here for a breath of fresh air. Me too. Let's go to the boat deck, huh? Why? Well, it's cool up there. It's quiet. We can have a little talk. I'm quite happy down here, thank you. That's a nice stone you got in that ring. Yes, it's, it's my engagement ring. Oh, let me see it. Oh, well, it wouldn't interest you. It, it's a star sapphire, but I happen to be rather fond of it. I got some very pretty sapphires in my cabin. You like to see them? Well, I'm afraid they wouldn't interest me. How do you know till you see them? I got a star sapphire I think you like. Well, I haven't any money to spend on things I don't want, Mr. Collada. Oh, I don't want you to buy it. If you like, I give it to you. Are you trying to make a pass at me? Of course. You don't blame me, do you? I think you're the best looker I've seen in donkey's years. 
Collada, my husband is a very jealous man. If I told him about this, he'd probably... <laughs> well, anyway, he wouldn't like it very much. He wouldn't do that. You're too much of a lady. Oh, will you please go away? I haven't offended you, have I? Yes, you have. Very much. I can't think why. Well, I do. If a fellow falls for me, he can't help it, can he? After all, it's very flattering for a fellow to fall for you. You can't deny that. Depends on the fella. I suppose I'm just not your type. Oh, well, you can't blame me for trying, can you? But most people I like, like me liking. Yes, I suppose you do have your triumphs. There's no accounting for taste. No ill feeling. Not on my part? No, of course not. Why should there be? Bless the spirit. Good night. Good night. God bless. <laughs> Ty, will you for me, darling? Stand still, silly. Can't help it. It's so wonderful to have you again after two whole years away from you. During which time I expect you were consistently unfaithful to me. I was not. You're the only girl in the world for me. And well, you know it. You do know it, don't you? Yes, of course. There you are. I shall be ready in a minute. You did miss me sometimes, didn't you? Yes, of course, all the time. It was hell for me. I was terrified you'd meet somebody you liked better. And if I had, what would you have done? Killed him. And you. <laughs> oh, dear, I'd better watch my step, hadn't I? Certainly had. They was a new, aren't they? Yes, do you like them? They look very expensive. Don't know how you do it on what I give you. They didn't cost much. Eight pounds, as a matter of fact. Really? Yes, I got them in one of those places in Oxford Street. Well, nobody would ever know. Oh. Well, that's a relief anyway. Come on, we're late enough already. Oh. Oh. Uh, Great. I got my back to bed at night. Good luck, ever. Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey. Ah, glad to see you. You know everybody, don't you? Hello. Hello. Do sit down. Hello, Ramsey. Uh, what do you have? I'd like a dry martini, please. Me too. What time do you expect the dock, Captain? Uh, Eleven in the morning. There's not much to see, but if you want to go ashore, there'll be plenty of time. We shan't sail till five. As a matter of fact, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey and myself were thinking of having lunch at the Grand. Then Collada asked us to join him. <laughs> we couldn't think how to get out of it, so I think we've decided to stay on board, haven't we? Yes. Of course, he's landing, isn't he? I imagine you won't be sorry to be rid of him. I certainly shan't. Yeah, thank, you. Huh? thank you. Do you know he's got his good points? Those prizes for the fancy dress dance he bought himself. Uh-huh. Chief Steward says they must have cost a pack. Oh, he's generous enough. 
You have to fight him to let you pay for a drink. And yet he's managed to make himself the most unpopular man in this ship. He really is terrible, and you know you can't snub him. No, you could kick him out of the house, slam the door in his face, and it never occurred to him that he wasn't welcome. <laughs> I suppose as he's leaving tomorrow, I really should have asked him into cocktails this evening. But I simply couldn't bring myself to. He is quite impossible. Oh, 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 Mr. Kalaba. Oh. Hello there! Not barging in, am I? But that fool of a steward didn't give me your invitation. Cigar? Well, thank you, I'm smoking. Oh, you are. Glad to see you. Uh, uh, what do you have? Scotch and soda. I always stick to the nickel of my native heath. Hello. 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 Say when? Uh, please. Though so you're leaving us tomorrow, Mr. Collado. Best of friends must part, you know. I'm going to Cairo to look at a pearl necklace that one of these Pasha fellows may be willing to sell, providing he gets a good price. Aren't you afraid that these cultured pearls will put you fellows out of business? They'll never do that. They'll never affect the market for real ones. As a matter of fact, I'm going to Japan to look into this cultured pearl racket. Uh, don't clever these Japs. They tell me not even an expert can distinguish between real and cultured. <laughs> That's what they always tell you. An expert can tell at once, and I'm an expert. You believe in blowing your own trumpet, don't you? <laughs> what else is a trumpet for? I'm in the trade, and what I don't know about pearls isn't worth knowing. They'll never get a cultured pearl that an expert like me can't tell with half an eye. Take my word for it, Mrs. Ramsey. That collar you're wearing will never be worth a penny less than it is today. It is nice, isn't it? Nice? I saw it the moment I came in. I said to myself, those pearls are the goods. Well, I didn't buy it myself, but I'd be interested to know how much you think it cost. Well, in the trade, around about, um, 1500 But it was bought in Bond Street. I shouldn't be surprised if they asked, um, 3000 3000 pounds, eh? That's right, and worth every penny. Well, you'd be surprised to know that my wife bought it in Oxford Street for eight pounds. Oh, oh, don't make me laugh. They're not only real, but they're as fine for their size as any I ever see. Will you bet on it? Bet? A tenor, it's imitation. Oh, done. But darling, you can't bet on a certainty. Why not? If I get a chance of making easy money like this, I should be a fool not to take it. Well, how can you prove it? After all, it's only my word against Mr. Collada's. Uh, show me your pearls, lady. I tell you for imitation. I can afford to lose a tenner. Take them off, darling, and let the expert examine them. I can't undo them. Oh. There you are. I was mistaken. That imitation. <laughs> <laughs> if there hadn't been, I should have had a serious talk with my wife. <laughs> Perhaps that will teach you not to be so cocksure another time, Mr. Noel. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We all make mistakes. <laughs> an attractive little wife like Mrs. Ramsay, would you let her spend two years alone in London while you were in Aden? <laughs> Mr. Noel. Call me Max. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, sanatorium is a story founded on my own experiences. And if you like to take the character of Ashenden as a flattering portrait of the old party who stands before you, you would perfect liberty to do so. Sanatorium. Ashenden had contracted tuberculosis of the lungs, and since at the time there were reasons that made it difficult for him to travel to Switzerland, 
The specialist he saw in London had sent him to a sanatorium in the north of Scotland. This is the first time you've been here, sir. Yes. Yeah. I thought I hadn't seen you before. You say that as though most of them come back again. Oh, there's quite a few that don't. Scotland's a grand place. Got the best climate in the world. And this is the best climate in Scotland. And your heart's in the Highlands all right, I see. <laughs> Aye, that's it, sir. Oh, I was in America once, but I had to come away. Terrible weather they have in that country. I was in one place where they hadn't had a drop of rain for six months. That's it, sir. Up there on the hill yonder, behind the firs. Oh, yes, big place. Ah, it's a real house, all right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You're Mr. Ashenden, I expect. Yes. I'm Miss Harding, the matron. Dr. Lennox is waiting for you. Good. He's quite handsome, isn't he? I'm sure he can't be 40. He was 40 on the 9th of September. I didn't get time to read all his papers, but I'm certain of that. Dr. Lennox shouldn't leave his patient's papers about. I don't think it's nice. He doesn't, as a rule. It just happened that he was called away from his room for a minute when I dropped in to see him this morning. And there were Mr. Ashenden's papers spread out on his desk. The x-ray photos and everything. And what was your impression of his lungs? I think it's only his left one. But I didn't have my proper glasses. Excellent. Excellent. Some of the best I've seen. My lungs? Hmm? No, no, no. This second batch of x-rays. I was asked Mayhart who did them. First rate. Uh, Dr. Lennox, mm -hmm. I don't know your methods here, but there are one or two things I'd like to ask you. Far away. Uh, what are my chances? And don't be gentle with me. I won't. There's no need to be. You're taking it in good time. You mean you can do something about it? Well, we can't guarantee anything, of course. It depends so much on yourself. But if you cooperate and do as we tell you, there's no reason why you shouldn't be completely cured. Well, how long will it take? Oh, impossible to say. It might be six months, might be a year. Every case is different. If you'd asked me, I should have said he was sound as a bell. He didn't look like an ordinary consumptive. Oh, but he isn't. It isn't hereditary. His grandfather died of heart at 83. And his father had a rhomboid. A rhomboid? Yes. But a rhomboid's a thing they use in drawing lessons. Well, that's what his father died of. Unless he was my wrong glasses. I'll show you to your room. You'd better go to bed right away. Go to bed? But I haven't had a day in bed since I had measles when I was nine. Well, now you're going to make up for it by having six weeks. Six weeks? Not a day less. Well, what am I supposed to do all day? Eat, sleep and read. Is that all? Isn't it enough? Well, I shall want a lot more books. Oh, we've a grand wee library here. I'll get you a few to be going on with. That's very good of you. Not a bit. I once read a story of yours that changed my whole life. Who's that playing? Well, that'll be Mr. Campbell. He's your next door neighbor. So I hear. Don't you like music? In moderation. They do say Mr. Campbell only plays to annoy Mr. McLeod up above in number 26. Apparently he succeeds. <laughs> oh, they're a pair, those two. But you get used to them. We all have. There. Cheerio, bye. <laughs>
just because you're up for the first time, don't think you can do everything at once. Take it easy for a day or two, and don't exert yourself. Not even for a walk? No, not even for a walk. I'll tell you when you can attempt that. You can go as far as the veranda, but that's all. Come along now. And meet your fellow prisoners. <laughs> You'll find them much the same as anyone else. Except for a, a bit more light and darkness in them, if you know what I mean. In what way? Well, the illness seems to bring out the best or worst in people. Sharpens the edges of their strength and weakness. Take those two playing chess, for instance. They're our oldest inhabitants. The one on the right's McLeod. He's been here 17 years. The other one's Campbell. He's been here over 60. <laughs> they hate each other like poison. Fight like dog and cat. But they're never out of each other's sight. I don't think they could live without one another. <laughs> oh, uh, before you make the next move, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ashenden. He's down for the first time today. Mr. McLeod, Mr. Campbell. Uh, how do you do? Always glad to see a new face. I've been looking at that one for 16 years. <laughs> well, don't let me disturb your game. Oh, that's all right. I've got them beaten anyway. In a couple of moves, I'll... Check. What are you talking about? I said check. Where did that bishop come from? Here. It wasn't there ten seconds ago when I looked away. Are you accusing me of cheating? Yes. <laughs> He's always like that when he loses. Do you play? Uh, not much. Uh, pity. Mr. Ashenden's down, I see. Yes, that's one worry off my shoulders at last. The books he got through. You've been librarian too long. You should let someone else have the job for a change. Oh, no. I enjoy it too much. <laughs> in the normal way. But his reading capacity was quite extraordinary. I believe he's sending to London now for some most peculiar books. How do you know? Matron told me. Oh, and I nearly forgot. We've a new man coming this morning. A Major Templeton. Templeton? Not George Templeton. Why, do you know him? I wonder if it's the same one. I don't know if his name's George, but he was in the guards. It must be George. Is he a relation of yours? Good gracious, no. Nobody in our family would behave like George Templeton. He... Uh, he once got a niece of mine into the most awful trouble. No. Yes, I'll tell you about it one day. But now I must see Dr. Lennox and find out if it's really he or not. I shall make a point of cutting him dead. Where's your room? Uh, the first floor, number 15. Oh, small. I know every room in the place. Mine's number 26. <laughs> that makes Campbell angry. Oh, why? It's the best room in the house. He wants it for himself. He keeps badgering the doctor for him, but I won't budge. Not for a fellow like that. Besides, I came here six months before he did. And 17 years is a long while. Oh, well, time passes quickly, and I like it here. Care for me to show you around? Well, thanks. Uh, if I went back to ordinary life now, I'd hate it. All my old pals would have gone their own ways. Uh, I wouldn't have anything in common with them anymore. Well, allow me. After this, the model's just a silly, noisy rush. Uh, what do you do with yourself all day? Do? Oh, TB's a whole time job, my boy. That's my temperature to take, and then I weigh myself. I don't hurry with my dressing. I have my breakfast, I read the papers, and go for a walk. Then I have my rest, my lunch, and play bridge. I have another rest and dine. I play a bit more bridge and go to bed. Doesn't he become a little monotonous? No, no, we've quite a decent library here. We've got all the new books, but I haven't much time for reading. No, I like to talk to people. We meet all sorts here. They come and they go. Sometimes they go because they think they're cured, but a lot of them come back again. Sometimes they go because they die. I, I've seen a lot of people out, and I expect to see a lot more. Mr. McLeod is all for looking on the bright side of things. I, with a smile on my lips and a tear in my eye, Burns. That's Scott. Oh, well, it was one of them anyway. Uh, Miss Bishop, this is Mr. Ashenden. How do you do? How do you do? She's English, but uh, she can't help that. <laughs> How long have you been here? Only two years. Dr. Lennox says I'll be all right in a few months' time, and I can go home. Don't be silly. Stay where you're well off. That's what I say. Good morning. Good morning. Major Templeton? That's right. Will you come along in? Oh, Dr. 
Dr. Lennox, I've been looking for you everywhere. Uh, something wrong? Well, I'm not sure till I've asked you something. <clears throat> something private. Hmm. Perhaps you'd better come inside. Thank you. Please don't think me inquisitive, now, won't Doctor. Won't you sit down? No, 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 thank you. But I really must know if the Major Templeton expected today is George Templeton. Yes, I think so. Why? But he's the most disreputable man. He's a rake and a liberty. He was correspondent in my poor niece's divorce case, and he wouldn't marry her. They wouldn't have been happy, of course, but they would have been respectable. I really don't think you ought to let him come here. Mrs. Whitbread, Major Templeton's morals are no concern of mine, nor of anyone else's in this sanatorium. As long as he is under this roof, he is my patient, and I shall do my utmost to bring him back to health. Come in. Major Templeton, Doctor. Ah, come in. Who's that old girl? I seem to know the face. Oh, uh, she's one of our patients. Will you sit down? Thank you. I always like to get in before the rush. And where does one sit? Do we have regular places? Oh, yes, yes. Of course, you can't expect to get the best table yet. That's uh, a matter of time. I expect you've got a pretty good one by now. Aye, we Campbell. With Campbell? It's easier that way. He's got a filthy temper, and I'm the only one that can deal with him. Mr. Ashenden, I put you over here next to Miss Bishop. Well, you'll be all right now. This is Mr. Ashenden. No, we've met. Mr. and Mrs. Chester. How do you do? Did you have a good walk? Well, I'm not allowed anything as daring as that for a day or two, but it looked lovely country. <laughs> it is beautiful, isn't it? Henry and I got right down to the river this morning. Didn't we, dear? Yes. Mrs. Chester isn't a patient. She's our guest for the day. Are you staying here? No, in the village. I, I come at once a month from London for the weekend. Well, that's a long way, isn't it? <laughs> yes, but it's worth it to see Henry. Every time I come, he seems so much better. Don't you think so, Miss Bishop? Oh, yes, much better. Hello. You're Templeton, aren't you? That's right. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Campbell. Uh, do you uh, like music? Yes, yes, very much. Good. There's not many here, do. Would you care to hear me play a little? Uh, I don't pretend to be a great artist, well, uh, but I'm not bad, really. I promised Lennox I'd be ready for him at three o'clock. Oh, that's all right. I'll find you. Come on. <laughs> Sit down, will you? I'll hand that to you. Thanks. I'll uh, play you a wee piece of my own composition, but uh, go directly to you, won't you? <laughs> You know perfectly well I'm allowed to play when it's not in silence hours. If you could play, yes, but not that infernal squeaking. And you, I don't know who you are, but you sit there encouraging him, hanging him on. Oh, come, I think he plays rather well. Oh, you do, do you? I wonder if you'd say that if you had that same blasted tune for 15 years, year in, year out. What? You don't know one tune from another. You never did. If you don't like it, you can lump it. Or change your room. You see, that's why he does it. He's trying to drive me out of my room because it's the best in the place and he wants it for himself. Ah, oh, there you are, Major Templeton. I wondered where you'd got to. Dr. Lennox is waiting for you. Coming, Major. Not so fast, Helen. I'm not as strong as you are. Sorry, dear. Would you like to rest a bit? We've gone all day. You've gone all your life. For the present, dear, we've only got the weekend. Don't let's spoil it all by quarreling again. I don't know why you wanted to waste the money. We really can't afford it. I'm glad you mentioned money. That's, that's what I really wanted to talk to you about. I thought there was a catch in it. Oh, Henry, please. I'm sorry, dear. What is it? Sit down, dear. Do you remember the Austins? They went to India three years ago. Yes, why? Well, they're back and they can't find anywhere to live. There's only the two of them. I thought it might be a good idea if we let them have half the house. 
They pay a decent rent and you wouldn't have to let Tom help us. I know how that worries you. But well, dear, what do you think? Why ask me? I thought we ought to talk it over. After all, our home's always meant so much to us. Our home's nothing to do with me anymore. Oh, it is, Henry. It's as much yours now as ever it was. All your things are there, just as you left them. Well, throw them away, give them away. I'll never use them again. Don't, Henry. You're right to think about your future and plan for it. But leave me out. You just seem to enjoy hurting me. Well, you shouldn't begrudge me that little pleasure, my dear. I shall be dead soon, and you can go on living for years and years and have a good time. It's not fair, Henry. Everything that's humanly possible is being done for you here. Then why don't they take more notice of me? Why don't they bother when my temperature goes up? Because they've given me up. They know it's a waste of time. They know I'm for it. There's no need to torture yourself like this. Why should this happen to me? Why? It's cruel and unjust. I could understand it if I led a wild life, played around with women, kept late hours. I should have deserved it then. But I haven't done any of these things. It's monstrously cruel. Lots of people here are worse than you are, Henry. Much worse. Come on, it's not like you to be so full of self-pity. You're just like all the rest of them. Come on, jolly him up. Pretend it's not as bad as it is. Well, I know what the truth is. They can't fool me. Look, Henry. Shall I let the Austins have the house or not? I don't care what you let them have, as long as you leave me in peace. I only want to be left alone. Strange how the Chester's quarrel. I hear he looks forward to her visit so eagerly it's almost pathetic. And now that she's here... Anticlimax, probably. Cigarette? No, no, thanks. Strictly forbidden, doctor's orders. Same here. Lennox tells me if I don't give him up, he'll give me up. Well, one can live forever, and I've had a thundering good time. In the army? No, you are, aren't you? I was. Retired three years ago. Cramped my style. I've had a lot of fun since then. Now, what sort of fun? Oh, you know, racing, hunting, shooting. South of France in the summer. It's a great place for the girls. Uh, so I've always heard. I like it pretty. It's one of my weaknesses. You married? No. I'm not either. And I don't intend to be. I like my freedom. Good afternoon, Mr. Ashenden. Oh, hello. Who's there? A Miss Bishop. Easy on the eye. I wouldn't try anything there, if I were you. Why? Oh, she knows her way around. She's not as unsophisticated as she looks. How did you find that out? Huh? I had a talk with her after lunch. She's been in one sanatorium or another for the last eight years, poor kid. I wonder if she'd like someone to hold her hand and be a big brother to her. I wonder. <laughs> Ashenden. Oh, yes, matron. Seven o'clock bedtime. Oh, so early? So late, you mean. You should have been in bed at seven, not just going. By the way, has anybody seen Major Templeton? He went to the library about half an hour ago. I haven't seen him since. Thank you. What would you advise me to read? I don't know what your tastes are. What about Jane Austen? Oh, I've never heard of her. Hasn't your education been rather neglected? Dreadfully. What about undertaking it? Well, I can think of much better ways of occupying my time. Such as? Minding my own business, for instance. There's a Sherlock Holmes. Why didn't you take that? Putting an end to the conversation. That could be the idea. Seven o'clock, Major Templeton. And what of it? Your bedtime. Bedtime? But I'm in the middle of a most intriguing conversation with Miss Bishop. Maybe, but we can't have you burning the candle at both ends. Come along now. Oh, all right. Look, I'm to be allowed out for my first stroll in the morning. Will you come with me? Well, I... I'm not very strong yet. Well, if you put it like that, I don't quite see how I can refuse. That was a kind lady.
Oh, hello. You going down to the village? Just to get my bag, then I have to catch my train. Oh, can I come with you as far as the gate? I'm not allowed any further yet. Please do. How long have you been coming up here like this? Two years. Oh, it's over two years now. Henry got wet one evening trying to finish some digging before the winter. We'd just bought an extra bit of land to make a little current garden. He caught a cold and, well, it turned to this. He's getting on all right now. Do you really think so? I'm so terribly worried. You mustn't be too unhappy about him. It's a long, slow business. I know I shouldn't talk about it, but, well, I can't help it. I love Henry. I'd do anything in the world for him. I want to help him to get well, but he says such hard, cruel things to me. He nearly breaks my heart. I think you're very patient with him. It must be very hard, but I'm sure it's only because he's ill. Thank you. We used to be so happy together. We had things to talk about all day long, but now... We're only together this one weekend a month. Everything I say makes him angry and impatient. But when he's well again... How can he get well when he's so terribly unhappy? You see, his home was everything to him. Here, he's nothing. He doesn't read or play cards. And the people here aren't really his kind. He just broods over his illness. You won't think any the worse of him for what I've told you. Oh, no, of course I won't. He's such a good man, really. Until this illness, I don't think an unkind or ungenerous thought ever entered his head. I'm sure it'll come all right. Well, this is as far as I can go. When shall we be seeing you again? I'll be up just before Christmas. Friday the 23rd. I shall look forward to seeing you. If you could have a chat with Henry occasionally, I'd feel so much happier. Of course I will. Don't you worry. Oh, thank you. Well, goodbye till Christmas, then. Till Christmas. I'm sorry Mrs. Hammond won't be here to see this. She was always so keen on a tree. Still, it's good to know she'll enjoy it in her own home this time. Yes. Oh, hello, Mr. Ashenden. Hello. I hear you had quite a long time with the doctor today. Nothing bad, I hope. Oh, no, no. Just my monthly checkup, that's all. Satisfactory? Quite. If all goes well, I shall be out of here by the spring. We shall be sorry to lose you, Mr. Ashenden. We were only saying just now, the sanatorium isn't nearly what it used to be. It's gone down most dreadfully. Oh, really? In what way? Well, there was a time when Dr. Lennox would ask people to leave directly he saw certain things beginning to happen. Why he should turn the blind eye on this present case, goodness knows. Nobody minds a little innocent flirtation when it is innocent. When they're nice young people who are going to get well. If you mean Miss Bishop and Major Templeton, I don't think there's anything to worry about. I happen to know a little more about Major Templeton than most people do. Did you know he was practically thrown out of the army for carrying on with the Colonel's wife? Really? He took my poor niece to Goodwood, lost a hundred pounds on one race, and then borrowed half a crown from her to tip the taxi driver. He's a terrible man. He's not fit to be in a sanatorium at all. And the way he's carrying on with that poor, innocent Miss Bishop, it's horrible. You know, the more I look at you, the more I like you. You're a very pretty girl. Thank you. I suppose a lot of fellows have told you that. A certain number, but it hasn't got them any further. Well, that's not very encouraging. It wasn't meant to be. You know, I've been in and out of sanatoriums for the past eight years, and I've developed quite a technique for dealing with predatory males. Oh, and you think I'm a predatory male? You have all the earmarks. You're frank, if nothing else. The chances are that we shall be here for a good long time, and I think it just as well we come to an understanding right away. Flirting bores me. All right. There's no reason why we shouldn't be good friends, is there? None. You don't dislike me? Not positively. I improve on acquaintance, you know. That, of course, remains to be seen. And you don't mind if I say I like you very much? I can't imagine why. You know, I've never met anyone like you. Would it be inquisitive if I asked how many women you'd said that to? Dozens. <laughs> That's better. You know, I think we're going to get on very well together. And that's the first kind word you've said to me. I think you're bad. Thoroughly bad. A lot of women rather like that in a man. Which is rather attractive. I wouldn't deny that for a moment. I suppose you wouldn't let me kiss you. I can't think of anything I'd like less. Oh. 
Well, let's change the subject and talk about something else. Yes, let's. Hello. Happy Christmas. Mr. Ashenden, are you meeting somebody? I'm meeting you. Me? My husband always comes. He isn't worse. No, no, no. He's all right. He's just a little tired. He's waiting on the seat at the bottom of the park. Let me take your bag. Thank you. You gave me quite a turn. It really is all right. Oh, yes, he's all right. It's just his last bit that tries him. Shall I take your basket? No, I'll carry it. What have you got there? Something he'll like. Bottle black blackcurrant from the bushes he planted himself. Sounds delicious. Yes, in the sample some. I was very worried when I was doing them. I tried out a different kind of jar with a new cap. But it was the most successful bottling I've ever had. Henry would be so pleased. I'm sure he will. All right, coachman. <laughs> Was it a nice journey? Lovely. Quite the best I've had. I got a corner seat all the way. How are you, dear? You look much better. Doesn't he, Mr. Ashenden? Oh, he's all right. I'll take that. Yes, you might as well have it now as later. With my best wishes, Henry, for a very happy Christmas. What is it? The black currants from the garden, of course. Don't you remember I promised to bottle you some? Are you mad bringing those up here? Haven't I enough to bear without your doing this to me? I'm sorry, Henry. What have I ever done to you to make you come torturing and tormenting me? I'm sorry, dear. I, I didn't think. You didn't think. It's time you did think. Campbell's enough to drive a buddy mad. Oh, what's he done now? Oh, Mrs. Chester said she liked that tuna visit Christmas, so he's played it every blessed day for the last six weeks. I won't pass out with TB. I'll go off my rocker, and it'll be his fault. <laughs> oh, hello. Glad to see you down again. It was only a bit of a cold. I'm all right now. What about that walk? Only as far as the wood, I'm afraid. Doctor's orders. Never mind. It's better than nothing. Mr. McLeod, would you mind finishing the game for me? I've nearly beaten him. I wonder if there is anything between these two. They do say he was a bit of a devil with the girls before he got ill. <laughs> I think that little girl can take care of herself. Uh, you never can tell. I've seen some rum things in my day. She had been awful fool to get stuck on him. She's got a chance of getting well. Oh, hasn't he? No, no. When I look at a fella, I make up my mind at once whether he'll get well or whether he won't. If he won't, I can make a pretty shrewd guess how long he'll last. I'd give Templeton about two years. Oh, you needn't worry. You'll be all right. I wouldn't have mentioned it if I hadn't been perfectly sure of that. I don't want Lennox to hoof me out for scaring his patients. <laughs> You're not tired, are you? I'm never tired when I'm with you, Evie. You know, when they told me I'd got to come up here, I never thought I could stick it. I'd be bored stiff. You've made it for me, Evie. I think I've never been as happy before. As long as you're here, I'm prepared to stay forever. Don't talk such rubbish. It's only because you're feeling so much better. No, it isn't only that. I suppose it hasn't escaped your notice that I've fallen in love with you. Would you take my advice? Always. Then fall out of it. Ask me to buy you a pearl necklace or jump over the moon, and by George, I'll do it. But don't ask me to fall out of love with you. In the first place, I can't. 
And in the second place, I don't want to. Bad business, isn't it? I suppose you're not in the least in love with me. What a fool I should be if I were. You once told me you had a technique for dealing with predatory males. Yes. How many of them tried to make love to you? Dozens. I'd like to wring the necks of every one of them. <laughs> Do you know I very nearly called you darling, then? Why didn't you? Wouldn't have meant anything anyway. Hard as nails, that's what you are. Mm, yes, I've got a beastly character. Well, that's a lie. You're the sweetest, kindest, prettiest girl in the world. Here's the afternoon rest, though. Curse the afternoon rest. We'll though. get into trouble from Dr. Lennox. Don't you think the time has arrived when you might let me kiss you? <laughs> well, I, I haven't given the matter much thought, but if you think it'll give you any pleasure, just once and just there. Just once and just there? Good afternoon. Did you see the guilty way they let go of one another's hands? And her hair all ruffled up? Might have been the wind. There isn't any wind. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Charles. May I sit down? Oh, do, please. Am I right in supposing that both you ladies have the good name of the sanatorium at heart? We certainly have. Aye, well, then you'll agree with me the time has come for the senior residents to take a strong stand to decide once and for all whether this is to be a high-class sanatorium or a, or a monkey house. Indeed we do, and I'm very glad you're taking the lead, Mr. McLeod. I dislike intensely the necessity of interfering with other people's pleasure. Pleasure, but... you call it? <laughs> I can think of a very different name. Oh, well, so could I, but let us be charitable and call it pleasure. We must force Dr. Lennox to take drastic measures. Shall we get up a deputation? No, I have a better idea. A petition. A petition to be signed by all the senior residents. Well, won't it be a little difficult to, to put a complaint like this into words? No, but why? It's perfectly simple and straightforward. I, I, I've got it here already. I've gone straight to the point without mincing matters. We, the undersigned, being resident patients of long standing in your sanatorium, hereby demand that you shall forthwith restrain Gordon Percival Campbell from slowly driving us mad by the incessant playing of his violin. We further demand that if he is caught playing within a radius of one mile of this sanatorium, he shall be requested to leave immediately. There. Now, if you two ladies will just sign it, eh? But... Uh... What has Mr. Campbell's violin got to do with it? Do with it? Well, that is it. But we thought you were talking about Miss Bishop and Major Templeton. But why should I? They don't play violins. But you must have noticed the disgraceful way they're carrying on. Well, what does that matter? It doesn't keep you awake. I wouldn't dream of interfering as long as they do it in silence. And I wouldn't dream of stopping poor Mr. Campbell from playing his violin. I like it. But those other two... Do you realize they spent the entire afternoon in the woods together? If you and Campbell spent a few afternoons in the woods together, you'd both be better occupied. Let me give you a cup of tea, dear. First tomorrow. I must remember to write to Mother. Why? Her birthday. Well, Mr. Chester, your wife will be coming up soon. That'll be something to look forward to. She's not coming this month. Oh, I am sorry. Why not? Dr. Lennox thinks it's better for me that she shouldn't. I say, that's a bit tough. Why don't you tell Lennox to go and jump in the lake? Well, he must know best. Oh. Never mind. Perhaps next month. I'm terribly sorry. You'll miss her visits dreadfully. I asked Lennox to write until I knocked him. Oh, but why? Because I can't stick it anymore. I spend the whole month looking forward to her coming, and then when she's here, I... I hate her. Oh, come now. I do resent so awfully having this beastly disease when she's strong and well. It maddens me to see the pain in her eyes. What it mattered to her, really. I'm sure it matters a great deal. Well, they pretend to care, but they're jolly glad that you were not them. 
Don't you think you'll make her unhappy by not letting her come? She'll have to put up with that. I've got enough of my own unhappiness without bothering with hers. Well, that's a bit hard on her, surely. It's all very well for you to be so unselfish. You're going to live. I'm going to die, and I don't want to die. Why should I? It's not fair. You know, I'm sorry for Chester. He doesn't seem able to stand up to things like the others. Oh, that's because he's sorry for himself. You know, they say suffering ennobles, but it's not true. As a general rule, it makes men petty, querulous, and selfish. Oh, I haven't noticed that much here. Oh, here. Yeah. There's much suffering in the sanatorium. It's night like fever that goes with TB excites rather than depresses, you know. By the way, when am I due for another checkup? Oh, come along in tomorrow. Better make it the afternoon. Oh, don't worry. You're all right. I'm hanged if I am. Oh, what's the matter? I had a bite for two hours. Now, this is the one taken the day you came. You see the band patch? Here. Mm -hmm. Now, this is last week's. You see? It's completely healed up. Good. Well, when are you going to throw me on? Oh, give it another month, and then you can go home. Unless you're thinking of settling down here for the next 17 years, like our friends Campbell and McLeod. <laughs> you know, I owe a lot to those two fellas. They've done more for my cure than your treatment. <laughs> They're the best comic turn we've had here for years. <laughs> Come on, come on. Give me time to think. Think you've been thinking all night of a leche. You know you've no more clubs. Leave it on the table. You played it. I've not played it. Let's cover. You picked it up when you saw my king. It's my trick. It's game all, and the clouds call the Grand Slam doubled. Redoubled. Redoubled. I redoubled them. Don't get excited, McLeod. Take it easy. Take it easy, you say. Take it easy. I've wanted a Grand Slam all my life, and now I've got it. A grand slam doubled and redoubled. Play that off on your blasted fiddle. You're a bad loser and a worse winner, but then, of course, you'll have a cloud. No, I don't mind your silly insults now. All my life I've wanted this, and thank heaven it's a Campbell I've done it on. All right, Templeton, I've got him. Give me a hand, Ashenden, will you? you a few flowers. That's sweet of you, but how on earth did you get them up here? I had them sent up from London. How very wrong and extravagant of you. They do smell sweet. Evie, would it surprise you if I asked you to marry me? No, I've been expecting you to do that for the last three months. Well, you might have told me I wouldn't have waited so long. Will you? <laughs> of course not. The idea is perfectly ridiculous. Why? Well, we're both patients in a sanatorium. We've come here to get well, not to get married. Does that mean you think I'm too great a crock? Oh, of course not. I'm very much in love with you. I fell in love with you the first day I saw you. Do you remember the day you were so beastly to me? <laughs> <laughs> that clinched it. Why have you never been married before? Oh, that's an easy one. Because till I met you, I've never met anyone I wanted to marry. Oh, it's absurd. It would be perfect madness for a pair of crocs like us to get married. But? I wonder if by any chance I'm in love with you. It would be nice for me if you were. You see, Adam, what it feels like being in love. Is it like being a bit tight? Much nicer. Oh, I wouldn't know. I've never been tight. But if it's being all of a dither when a particular person comes into the room, then I suppose I am in love with you. My oh, sweet. I've been so lonely all these years. You too. Yeah, I was too much of a fool to know it. Come in. Oh, hello, Campbell. Oh, you don't look very happy. 
I'm not. Oh, what's the trouble? I thought all your worries were over. You've got McLeod's room now. Aye. It was about that I wanted to see. I have been up there all the morning, but uh, I... Well, I... I'd like to go back to my old room, if you don't mind. Oh, good heavens, man. You pestered me for years to let you have McLeod's room. You pestered me to get him out of it so that you could have it, and now, George, you come here saying you don't want it. I know, I know, I know. <sighs> dear, oh, dear. You look careful. You are a funny chap. Why don't you ever play a violin now? I haven't heard you play it since McLeod died. It's no fun anymore. I used to get a kick out of playing because it made the poor chap angry, but now nobody cares whether I play or not. Oh, I'll never play again. No oh, nonsense. You used to say that you couldn't live if you didn't play. What today? Grand, isn't it? Spring's here at last. Yes, there are snowdrops out there in the woods. You're off, are you? Yes, a couple of weeks. I'm off too, quite soon. Oh, really? <laughs> Surprised? No, not at all. Why should I be? You will be when I tell you why. I've asked Evie Bishop to marry me. Oh. What did she say? She said it was the most ridiculous thing she'd ever heard in her life. I was crazy to think of such a thing. Well, you must admit that she was right. Quite. She's going to marry me just the same. <laughs> now, you're looking at me like those two old ladies. Has Lennox passed you as fit? I don't need a doctor to tell me I'm fit. I never felt better in my life. Fresh air, quiet life, leaving. What more could a man want to put him on his feet again? Are you really in love with her? Huh. It's a rum thing at my time of life, falling in love with a decent girl. It's the last thing I've ever expected of myself. You know, I always thought girls, decent girls, I mean, shocking boys. But she isn't. No. She's charming. Pretty, too. And clever as paint. But that isn't what bowled me over. You know what it is? Ridiculous when you come to think of it. An old rip like me. Virtue. The last thing I ever wanted in a woman. Surprises you, I suppose. Oh, no, not at all. You're not the first rake that's fallen for innocence. It's just middle-aged sentimentality. <laughs> Dirty dog. Well, what does Lennox say about it? I don't know yet. Evie thought it was a good plan to have a checkup, and I did the same. I made a lot of tests and took some x-rays. You need to tell us about it at four o'clock this afternoon. When are they seeing the doctor? Uh, four o'clock, I think they said. It's the most scandalous thing I ever heard of. It's worse than scandalous. It's criminal. Somebody ought to write to their relations about it and get it stopped. Dr. Lennox will stop it. You see. Put that away. Have some more tea. No, thank you. Y yes, yes, I will. Oh, Major Templeton, Dr. Lennox is free now. Nervous, are you? No, not a bit. Maya. I'm no more nervous than you are. I've got good reason to be. It means all the world to me. Don't say things like that. You'll make me cry. Hang it all. I can't help it if I'm so much in love with you, I can't see straight. Will you kiss me?
Come in. Uh, when? Uh, let me see. Uh, yes, yes, I can do that. Yes, yes, I'd love to. Well, it's very good of you to ask me. <laughs> Come along in, sit down. I won't be a minute. Huh? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I can easily get away for a couple of days. My assistant's first rate. Yes. Well, I'm looking forward to it very much. All right. Goodbye. The chap I know has just asked me over for a couple of days fishing. He's got the best salmon in Scotland. Well, now, I've got the whole story here. Results of the tests, x-rays and everything. Would you care for me to go over them in detail? No, there's no need for that. You understand them better than we do. All we want to know is whether we can get married. I'm afraid it would be very unwise. How unwise? Well, I'll tell you the facts, and then you must decide for yourselves. I don't think Miss Bishop will ever be strong enough to lead a normal life. But if she goes on living, as she has done for the past eight years... In the sanatorium? Yes. Then there's no reason why you shouldn't live comfortably if not to a ripe old age, at least as long as any sensible person wants to live. The disease is quiescent. If you marry, if you attempt to lead an ordinary life, the infection might quite well flare up again. What the results of that might be, no one can foretell. And how about me? Your case is different. I wouldn't be as brutal as this if I could avoid it, Templeton. But since you've asked me, I must tell you. If you marry, you'll be dead in six months. And if I don't? Don't worry, you can tell me the truth. Two years. Three, perhaps. Thanks. That's all we wanted to know. As I said, Dr. Lennox has stopped it. If he hadn't, they'd have come down and told us long ago. Poor things. I wonder where they are. They're in a the little library upstairs. I went in for a book. They were alone, so of course I came right out and left them. Was she crying? No, she was smiling. Here they are. What's the matter with you two? You're looking as pleased as punch. Oh, nothing very much. We're just going to be married. You're not. But we are. Who ends it to be? As soon as we get the license? We want to be married here. In the village church? Yes, I'm afraid my family would disapprove, so we're not going to tell them that it's all over. I shall ask Dr. Lennox to give me away. Mr. Chester, I would so much like your wife to come to the wedding. Do you think she would? Well, I... Do please ask her. It's kind of you to want her. I... I'll write today. Thank you. Goodbye, Ashley. Goodbye. 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 Goodb